And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Francisco Valentin, who after his near-death experience, started having communication with non-physical beings and still does today. Francisco, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Francisco, let's start on the day that you died and go from there. Yes. Uh, it all started one summer day, 1979, when at the young age of barely turning 18 and due to a terrible car accident, I died. Uh, if you share the, the image of the car, uh, what happened was that I lost, I mean, the story is lengthy, but to make it short, I lost control of my car. I jumped the medium. I fell into the opposite lane. I sidewiped another car, which made me spin. And after I finished spinning, another car hit me at the door frame at around 60 miles an hour. Uh, if you see the image, the impact was so severe that the actual the driver's door ended up by the center console. My, my driver's seat disappeared in the crash, and I ended up on top of my friend's lap, dead. Uh, and I know he's dead because many years later, when I asked him, uh, he, he confirmed that I was dead on his lap. Uh, another confirmation was that when I showed that very image, at, uh, when I was... Uh, uh, practicing for screen sharing for another interview, actually at the Spiritual Awakening International, uh, the Vice President, Robert Baer, uh, he, once he saw the image, he said, in my 25 years of experience as a California Highway Patrol sergeant, I've never seen anyone surviving that car accident. How did you? And I candidly said, I didn't. <laughs> and after a few laughs, uh, he told me that uh, that accident must have occurred at no less than 60 miles an hour. And that was actually correct. And the reason why was because uh, the, the legal repercussions of the accident didn't go any further because the driver's passenger told my dad that his wife froze when she saw me. She never let go of the accelerator and she ran into my car. So that's how, that's how it all ended. Now, as to what I do remember is that I froze also. I froze, I jumped the medium. I just can't remember just sparks of memory. And the last thing that I remember when I stopped spinning, holding my steering wheel, wheel was this movement to this side. And that's when my soul, let's say, detached from my body, my physical body. And I went into what I learned to call the void. Uh, when I say the void, I don't mean the void out in the cosmos. It's a void inward. When I realized that I was still myself, I did not become anything else like I was taught. I mean, I, I I was born and raised as a Catholic. So I understood that I would have become an angel or something like that, but I didn't. Neither I saw God or, or anything like that. It's just, I was just in the midst of the void. I could not say that I was suspended in, in air because neither I had a body. And one of the things that I clearly remember is understanding that I was myself, but never being Francisco Valentin, or even being a human being ever, ever, ever. I was simply myself. No physical body, nothing whatsoever. Now, you said that this void was not out in the cosmos. You feel like it was within, but is it possible that this void was a realm separate from everything else, like a place of beginning? 
Well, if, if you want to give that definition, I'm okay with that because I cannot define and I cannot say uh, what it is by definition uh, because, I mean, humanity love to describe things and give definition. I cannot define it other than knowing as a fact, as I knew that I was something, but not someone. And then by knowing that I was in a place that there were no creation and I didn't belong to the creative world. It is something that is not learned, but remembered. And that will help me understand it better so I can explain it. All we're doing is remembering. So in that place, you were just basically an awareness. I could say that because there was no physical body. I mean, later on in life and uh, through all this work that I'm doing, I learned that we are mind, we are thought. Uh, everything is mind, everything is thought. And we're just manifesting on a physical plane of reality created by ourselves. But that's another story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in the meantime, uh, staying staying with, uh, with what we're doing, uh, what I'm trying to explain here, while I was in that void, uh, I realized that there was a dim light far, far away from me. And I must admit that at that point, being myself, I felt, uh, I felt, uh, let me, let me find this word. I found myself confused. Although I didn't remember who I was, there was some level of confusion. And I asked myself three questions. Who am I? Who's my father? And who's my mother? Those questions that I ask myself now, today, I know that is me trying to find my identity. Who am I? Where did I come from? What's my purpose in life? But they were created in my mind because, again, I was only 18. I was still a child. So my, my knowledge was very limited to who I am and what I was taught through religion. And that's what made me so confused because none of this that I'm experiencing has to do with what I was taught that it was going to be. Now, as to that light, as that little light kept approaching me, and when I say that I saw, I am not saying that I saw with my physical eyes <clears throat> or my astral views of everything. It is just a perception that we can translate into an image that we can later uh, translate through the brain to be able to speak and explain. But still, none of that exists. It's just our perceptive mind to help us identify and explain and, and, and make something out of it. So as that light approached, I realized that that light was not a light, but they were spiritual beings approaching me and they started swirling around me in a counterclockwise position. As they were surrounding me, I began to feel this love and peace that there is no way that I can that I can explain because it's something that goes beyond our physical and mental capacity to understand. For instance, uh, when someone says, that it was an unconditional love. We really don't know what unconditional love is <clears throat> because even the mother that said that loves his, her, her child with unconditional love is still conditional because you're my child. Why not doing that with my neighbor's child? <clears throat> so uh, the, 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 what we feel is a love that is conditional and limited, but that type of love 
it's so out of reach for human comprehension that I rather call it peace. Because peace is within you. It doesn't need a, a, a second or a third party. It's just peace. So I rather call it peace. They were giving me this peace that I was bathed on it. It was so beautiful. When suddenly I wanted, uh, through my curiosity, I wanted to see what uh, what those beings were trying to identify. For instance, I was saying all the time, where am I? Who am I? Where am I? So, so logically, I was trying to, to comprehend what was going on around me. And as I paid close attention to one of those beings, I was able to, to grasp a figure that I was able to translate, and I shared it, it, that with you on, the, on an image that I created, and I stretched it up and tried to make it in such a way that your audience can understand mostly what I saw. And uh, there was a point at which I was glazing over that image, and we kind of made contact somehow when I realized that that entity was acknowledging my presence and I was acknowledging its presence. I rather call it spiritual beings because I don't want to go into any other type of definition uh, and I want to leave it like that. When suddenly I feel this presence that I didn't see, I felt a presence kind of behind me, like a like a huge cloud outcasting everything around it. And the next thing I know, I felt like I was falling into a funnel, getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And as it was getting narrower, I begin to feel my body, my physical body aching. And as I kept getting narrower and narrower, the pain got so unbearable that that's when I took my first breath, opened my eyes, and someone was extracting my physical body from my car. How do I know? Because I remember the edge of the windshield when I opened my eyes and someone was taking me out of the car. Uh, now, as to what happened after that, that's that's another story. But uh, but as a, as, a, as a matter of fact, the accident took place at four o'clock, approximately, and I was taken from out of my car at approximately 6 p.m. in the afternoon. How do I know? Because by the time I was being removed from the car, it was a summer day in the Caribbean. My, my homeland is Puerto Rico. And in summer day, about 6 o'clock, you know, sun started coming down, and I was fully aware of the... Uh, of that uh, of that experience of being on the floor, looking up, and seeing already the sky kind of dusk, and uh, so that means that I was dead and for approximately two hours. Uh, again, the the details are much much more extensive, but that that's that's another hour, <laughs> so 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 to speak. As to what happened to me, nobody knows, number one, how I survived. Nobody knows how come after that impact, I didn't break my back. And I'm not, you know, paraplegic or breaking my neck or even my brain. If you, if, if you pay close attention to the image and the impact at 60 miles per, per hour, my brain, my my jelly brain would have been broken. I mean, I still don't know how I survived and no one can explain how I did it. So when I, after my recovery, uh, just, just 
for you to know, just in case, uh, for your audience to know what happened to me then after such an impact. Well, I fractured my pelvic bone in multiple areas. I broke my rib cage on the left side. A metal strip from the car pierced my my uh, my rib cage, uh, collapsed my lung, uh, severed my spleen, destroyed in pieces, and then and, and punctured my lung. If you follow the physical aspect of this experience, I would have bled to death within hours. And I didn't. And the only reason why I didn't is because my heart must have stopped. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made it. Because I was removed from my car at 6 p.m., but I didn't go on to surgery until after 9 p.m. So if you do the math, it doesn't add up. But after my recovery and three months later, and after having to practically learn how to walk, I tried to explain what happened to me. Uh, and I was immediately shut down by my friends, my relatives, society, culture, religion. I remember going to the priest because I kept, you know, trying to explain what happened to me. And someone told me, you know, go to the priest, maybe he can help you. So I did, and I went to the confessionary, did whatever, you you know, the thing that you have to say at the confessionary. And at the end, the priest asked me to do, I don't know how many Hail Marys and, and, and the father, and I say, wait a minute, what did I do wrong? I mean, what? I mean, so I decided, you know what? I'm going to keep it to myself and take it to the grave. But one little aspect that I want to add is that the only person that listened to me was my mother. And I remember that she told me that when she saw me at the hospital, the only thing that I kept saying over and over again was how beautiful it was over there and that I did not want to come back. That I do not remember. I do not remember whatsoever. Why do you think you survived this car accident? Uh, that's what I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> so I decided to keep it to myself and take it to the grave. So I got married. Uh, I raised uh, three beautiful children uh, and everything was good and dandy until one day. And that day was July 7, 2011, when at the... At approximately 10 p.m. Eastern Time, my 20-year-old son at the time went into a spiritual trance out of nowhere. And a spirit of light manifested through his voice to remind me of an agreement that took place in 1979 in return for my life. In other words, my 20-year-old at the time he went into a trance, something never experienced before. That is a subject we don't talk. Remember I said that I was going to keep it to myself and take it to the grave? Uh, my 20-year-old went into a trance, and that spirit of flight manifested through him to remind me of that agreement. But first, once my son was in trance, he answered all my questions, all those questions that I didn't get an answer from humanity. And before the spirit left, it granted me what I learned to call higher truth. So I can finish my quest, my lifelong quest, trying to find out what happened to me and begin my work. Uh, and after that happened and higher truth started manifested in me, let me say that higher truth is like a life review, a life review where I was not the doer because the doer is the one who knows what's happening in front of him or he or her. And, uh, and I got, I got that, that perception of what transpired during that time. But when you are the observer, you're seeing the whole picture. 
everything around you. And that's what people most likely call a life review when they die, that they see their life and, and all, all the things that they did, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and so forth. But this higher truth was given to me as like sparks of memory recalls when I realized that in 1979, yes, indeed, I died. And it was for me to attest to the fact that there is life after death. Then higher truth manifested in me on another spark of memory recall when I realized that in the year 2000, I witnessed my mother die and come back to solve some legal issues for me to learn that there is divine intervention. But in 1979, I didn't see it because I was too young. In the year 2000, I didn't see it because I believe the medical world. That in the year 2002, another spark of memory reminded me that in the year 2002, I had what I might call a near-death experience when I got out of my physical body and I was transcending to another realm to learn how perception works. But I didn't see it at the time either because I was too involved in the physical world and I didn't pay attention. But as the, observers, as the observer, I was able to see the whole picture and the reason why I was getting that lesson. That in the year 2010, another memory spark showed me that a prophecy was given to me. Now, to that one, I did pay attention because it is a kind of funny story to tell. And through that prophecy, uh, to give the long story short, I went, uh, while meditating, I went into a, into a, uh, into a, how do you call it? A swirling, and then I touched bottom. And when I touched bottom, an inner voice told me, from now on, you're not going to learn from outside sources. And moving forward, you're going to learn from within. Boom. And then that ended. And I didn't know, I paid attention, but I didn't know what it was about. And what was prophesied in 2010 came to pass on July 7, 2011, when the Spirit of Light manifested to my son's voice, and I had access to higher truth. Now, uh, as the story goes, what happened between my son and I, which is the most critical part and the reason why I'm becoming uh, to public speaking, is because my son, uh, on that evening in question, I mean, I was sharing time with my son. My wife was traveling uh, business travel. My youngest daughter was travel, uh, studying abroad, one of those uh, people to people exchange programs. And I was spending time alone with my 20 years old son who was going to college and he was uh, on summer vacation with me. After a full day, we were gonna call it the night and suddenly uh, my, uh, you know, we were, uh, we were saying goodbye. I gave him the usual hug. Good night, my son, see you tomorrow. And that's when my son said, wait a minute, stop that. I wanted to show you a music that I like to hear when I want to find peace. And I want to share that with you. I was kind of tired, but I said, well, you know, something compelled me to say, okay, so let me go to the restroom. And when I come back, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll share. So I was barefooted uh, and I was uh, walking towards his uh, room. And when I got close to the door frame, I realized that he already had the music kind of loud. He was looking at the opposite wall, facing the opposite wall, and he was moving his his head rhythmically with the with the sound of the music. So when I approached the door frame, he immediately said, Hey dad, look how beautiful. I can see orbs all around me. 
But I realized that he had his eyes closed. I was barefooted. He couldn't have heard me nor seen me. So how did he do that? So as I approached and I said, but what do you mean? And he said, no, it's beautiful. Look, a beautiful orbs all around me, but we are one. And I said, what do you mean we are one? And that's when his voice turned unemotional. And he said, I mean, we're one. Mm -hmm. I still thought that he was doing a prank of me. And I stood and I said, you know, I just wanted to get him out of balance so he can say, ha ha, I fooled you or whatever. And I said, what do you mean we're one? And he said, because we're one. And then I said, and how did it happen? And he said, it happened because it had to happen. And I kept asking the same question in different forms to see if I can get him another answer or, or get him out of balance and he will give up and he will say, ha, ha, I got you. But it never happened. That's when I began to ask those questions questions that I never got an answer from humanity. And they were answered one after another in a way that I could understand at the level I was at that moment. Until one moment that I felt that when I kept asking the questions and I was getting the answer, I began to realize that I was formulating my questions in my head. And before asking the question, I was already getting the answer. And that bugged the heck out of me. And out of frustration, I said, but what am I doing here? And that's when my son Stop moving his head, turn around, stood up, opened his eyes, and very energetically, he said, don't you remember that you and I agreed for me to come down for you to help me do my job? Then closed his eyes, turned around, sat down, and began to move his head rhythmically. And that's when I actually surrendered. Uh, a few more conversations came about, and after that spirit left the body of my son, I asked my son, I mean, I, I was petrified. I said, I, I mean, when he got out of the train, I, I, I told him, do you know what happened? Do you remember what just happened? And he said, yes, I remember everything. Later on, he admitted that the way he remembers as he would always known. As he would have always known. And then I will ask him, but do you remember when you stood up and you told me? And he said, no, I don't remember that. I said, are you sure? I mean, a hundred percent, a hundred percent sure. So, so Jeff, imagine how much energy that spirit must have had to take away my son from the picture, take his body, stand up, open his eyes, tell me what he told me, close his eyes, sitting down, and then let my son come back. After that experience, we went to bed. I mean, I was, I couldn't believe myself. But the following day, I woke up with this urge to write. I am not a writer. I don't like writing. I don't like, I don't even like reading. But I had this urge. So I opened my laptop and I said, okay, so what am I going to do? And when I start punching the keyboard, I realized that I was transcribing verbatim, word by word, what took place the night before. Let's call it automatic writing. 
because I did not have that ability. I know myself. I'm, I hardly remember names. But I was transcribing word by word what transpired on that evening. And uh, I titled it First Transcript. Subsequent nights after that event, I began to wake up between 1 and 3 a.m. in the morning to download information so beautiful, so exquisite, that I understood so perfectly, but yet was so complicated. And as I understood it, I began to wake up in the morning and I started writing, but I mean, imagine waking up at 1 a.m. trying to write. I mean, you're scribbling. So it got to the point that I said, no, I cannot do that. So I started recording. But then again, I'm on recording and I'm mumbling words. So every time that I transcribe one of those recordings, it, it's, it takes forever because I have to remember what took place. But I wasn't downloading just as if I were a recorder. I was downloading as I received their intent. Let me explain. The intent precedes the thought. First, you have an intention. Then that intention becomes a thought. That thought creates a way for creation to take place, either in writing form or in physical form or in a thought form, an idea or whatever. And then you create. So as when I say that I received the intent is that I received that intent, which I translate into words. And then those words, either I speak them out or I write them down. Sometimes there are images in abstract form that I know exactly what this line means and what these circles mean and what this triangle means and what this pathway means. To you, it will mean nothing, but I know exactly what it means. And as I receive the intent, I can write it down to later on being able to explain it in as many ways as possible because I received the intent. Just to give you an example, and uh, and I am not putting down anyone whatsoever, but, but for example, there are many mediums or channelers that they go into a trance or whatever, and then they don't remember, or they remember very little of what transpired. Uh, one case is uh, Edgar Casey. He didn't remember at all anything. He just went by what he wrote, or no, his secretary, Gladys Turner, uh, wrote. Or others, uh, they remember vaguely. In my case, I remember everything because I received the intent. So you're saying that even if you didn't write it down, you would still remember everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Actually, uh, what... Uh, through the transcriptions, I have learned from uh, from this group. I, I learned to to understand that they were a group of some people call them ascended masters, uh, spiritual beings, uh, non-human intelligence. You know, you can name it whatever they want because they have not identified themselves as such. But I did ask. I mean, if if I'm if you're channeling, you want to know who you're channeling, right? So, so I ask, one time I ask, and I say, who are you? And the response that I received was, name calling limits the source through reasoning, rather say that it comes from the collective forces of knowledge and wisdom. So as you can see, those words are not common words, uh, but let me explain it this way for your audience, just in case. Name calling limits the source through reasoning means that if I am the source and you ask me for 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 me to give you my name, if I say if I say that I am, let's say Archangel whatever or, or Angel whatever, 
I won't be able, I, I will be limiting myself to the message that I'm bringing you because of, of the reasoning that you will have towards my words. So if I talk about, let's say, reincarnation, you're going to say, whoa, wait a minute. So the source is limiting itself. Rather say that it called from the collective forces of knowledge and wisdom. Now, why the collective forces of knowledge and wisdom? Number one, because there's a lot of knowledge, but very little wisdom in our world. And number two, the full collective forces of knowledge and wisdom, because there's more than one, uh, which I learned to identify by their personalities, because every being has a personality. Uh, so, uh, so as of today, I have over 500 transcripts because I keep doing this every night until one day that I say, wait, wait a minute, you cannot do this. I mean, I'm getting burned. So we reach an agreement in which they come forward uh, uh, during the day at any time, uh, just helping me understand things, uh, giving me lessons so I can pass on. But uh, but the transcript on themselves are geared toward people understanding the long forgotten concept of oneness. Uh, and the message comes forward without theological ties this time around. What I mean by that is that this is nothing new. This is something that had been known for eons, uh, way beyond uh, the history that we know, beyond the gods of those days and the God that we know, even before time, when the first movement took form or went about. Did they ever reveal to you why they chose you? No, and, and that's a very good question because it's going to take me back to remember when I say that I do not, uh, that I, after that presence came forward, I went into a funnel. Uh, I was dead for over two, uh, over two hours. That experience felt like five minutes. And I don't remember after that presence, I don't remember anything. And I had to be reminded of that agreement that took place. And I still don't remember. I just know because I was told. But I now I understand that the reason why I don't remember is because my job must have been to, I mean, for let, let's put it this way. For, for a spiritual communication to take place, first, that entity must lower its vibrational level. And I had to increase my vibrational level so we can meet and communicate. That's how mediumship or channeling comes about. Because I am unaware of what's going on, I did not raise my energy, uh, my, my frequency level. And I had to be reminded by a third party of something that probably I forgot or something that I wasn't allowed to remember so I can learn from the heart. It's like, for example, people say, well, why, why don't we remember when we reincarnate? We should remember. Well, if you remember when you reincarnate, it's like, for example, if I were to remember that I had an agreement I would have done everything that is in my power to get that agreement, although I wasn't ready. Because I wanted to do it. Because I have an entrustment. Because I want to, I want to, I want to. And that's the wrong position to start with. It had to come from the heart. From the will. And I still today don't know except the fact that they remind me of this agreement. I know that I had an agreement and I, you know, now it makes sense 
why I returned to do this, to help this entity or this group of entity deliver the message. But I can only deliver the message if I go through the experience. Remember when I told you that I received the intent? When I received the intent, I go through the experience because I received that intent. And that experience, I transmuted into a thought to, and then into action. So in other words, when that entity manifested through my son's voice and reminded me of that agreement, I'm doing what I have to do, although I still don't know why am I doing this. Let me ask you two questions. Sure. One, did you make the agreement during your NDE or pre-birth? And two, when your son went into this trance, was it spontaneous for him? Okay, yes. It was spontaneous to him. He had never had that experience before. And your first question, I have no clue if that was before my birth, having to go to the process to then having to manifest as I do today. No clue whatsoever. Uh, but your question raises a lot of other questions. And one of them is, how did I survive? If I wouldn't have some kind of intervention, because as Robert Baer said, in his 25 years, he's never seen anyone survive in that accident. What made me so special? So it could have been that I was protected somehow because I shouldn't have I mean, my body would have been so tragically destroyed that it wouldn't be no way to come back to a physical body that is already frozen cold. I mean, then it, it could have been. I don't know. I don't. I have the answer to many questions, but I don't have. I don't have all the answers. Still today, out of those five hundred transcripts that you wrote down. Can you share with us some of the most shocking things that you learned? <laughs> wow. Well, the most shocking thing that I learned is the nature of our existence. Uh, okay, let's, let's put it this way. We all should know that we are the sum total of all our experiences the day we were born. That simple. We are the sum. We are who we are because of our experiences since our birth. The way they raise you, either you have good parents, crappy parents, good environment, crappy environment. I mean, you name it. And uh, the interpretation that you gave to those experiences, that's what makes you who you are today. But going into a higher truth, you are the sum total of all your experiences since creation took form. That explained previous lives, previous life experiences, uh, talents that you had that you know they didn't come from your parents, uh, and all, all, all that that, had, that you know that you came with that, that comes from other lives. But if you go deeper into that, you are the sum total of all your experience since the first movement, since your first movement, since the moment that you separated from the source, because we're one. And, uh, and that brings me to something that the collective have asked me to, to give at the end of every interview or lecture that I give. And it's the one message that encapsulates all the transcript, which is, if we ever understand that we are one infinite mind, endlessly expanding through the physical and spiritual realm, limitless, then we will understand that the physical world is only an illusion. Now, let me rephrase this or explain a little bit further through a little bit of higher truth. 
if we ever understand that we are one infinite mind, doesn't mean that I am one infinite mind and you are one infinite mind and he is one infinite mind and that other is one infinite mind. No. It means that we all are one infinite mind. That's one of the lessons that I learned. Uh, another lesson that I learned is... Uh, Let me stop you there. So are you saying that we are one mind that has been separated into billions of parts? Okay. Bill billions of egos that that think it's separate, but it's really not. Exactly. Uh, I don't want to bring religion to it, but it's the easiest way for most people to understand, although it's hard to grasp, but we are God in individuality form expressing itself through the physical realm, through the physical senses. That makes us one. We are the individuality of God. And God is not a being. God is a thought. Interesting. I know you can't answer for God, or maybe you can, but I would, I feel that we may see this in the comments, and that would be something like, if we are God, why would we come here to suffer? Because we separated. I mean, this, this had been given in, in metaphors and analogies uh, all over the world from different religions. I mean, for example, the in the, for Christianity, the prodigal son. In Buddhism, uh, the, the uh, I forgot in Buddhism. In Buddhism, it is similar, uh, the lost son or something like that. Uh, he had been given in, in many, many ways, uh, Adam and Eve, you know, the, the apple, the, you know, it, it is. When I was a child, I learned from a teacher that God found himself lonely and he wanted to see himself. And if he wanted to see himself, wouldn't that be duplicating himself? And that duplicity, having the same essence of God, wouldn't want to see himself as well? And another one see himself as well? And another one see himself as well? Uh, we basically, and this is, this is another metaphor. I mean, I mean this, none of what I speak can be comprehended by the human brain other than through metaphors. So do not take me literally. Do you think by separating himself, God got himself into a trap? Uh, God is still learning. <laughs> still learning. I mean, people say, that, uh, I don't want to get into trouble, but people say that God do this, do that. He gives and takes away no, it is us who separated, who wanted to learn, who wanted to, the wanting, the wanting of the self. I want this, I want that. God doesn't move. God is an energy. God is a source. Uh, God is an essence. Uh, people say uh, the universe, no, I mean, or we are energy. We're not energy. We manifest through energy. We're not the verb. We are the subject. We are the individuality of God. We're the subject. And through vibration is how we move. It's about movement. God doesn't move. God is an energy. Just It's, it's a source. Now, what is God? No one can answer that because no one was there. That's something that cannot, I mean, our human uh interpretation cannot grasp that uh 
through the transcript, I, I have a lot of information and I will invite all your listeners to go to my webpage. It is the transcript.org. Uh, just browse around some transcripts and uh, if they would sound with you, keep reading and you're going to find a lot of, for example, let, let me give you what. Let, let, let me let me see if I can. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, well, let me ask you this while you're thinking. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you, but no, that's okay. Do you think then that God wanted to evolve, and this is the process to do so? That would be an opinion, because no one knows. And from what I learned from the transcript, it had been us all along who separated from the source. Well, I, I can go, I, if you have time and if you want to, I can get, uh, I can get you to an experience I had in 2013 when I was taken in an astral travel to the source. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, like, as, as you already know, I began doing the transcript on July 7, 2011. In 2012, I went through what people call the, the dark night of the soul. Uh, and that was an awful experience. I almost committed suicide. Uh, I was totally deceived by this entity that, that interfered. And uh, it was me who was at fault because I allowed that to happen. You you heard the word curiosity killed the cat. Well, the curiosity killed the cat. So after overcoming that experience, I learned this through that experience. You cannot know what light light is unless you first know what darkness is. You cannot tell me that something is good if you cannot compare it to something that is bad. Otherwise, how do you know that this is good if you don't compare it to something that is bad? So through that analogy, let's go back. Let's go now to 2013. In 2013, I was doing my daily chores when suddenly I hear this inner voice that says, trust me. So I look around and I don't see anyone. I said, well, part of my imagination. So I kept doing my thing. The following day, while doing some other stuff, that inner voice came again. Trust me. And I looked around and I said, okay, this that that is not my imagination because it already happened twice. What is this all about? I was clueless of, of why this is happening. But the third time, that voice came up about and said, trust me. Actually, it was in Spanish, confía en mí. And at that point, I said, something inside me said, okay, I'm going to trust you. The moment, not by word, but by intent. And through my intent, I will tell you that I said, okay, I trust you. But I didn't say a word. It's just that in my mind, okay, I'm going to trust you. And as I opened myself, I let go of everything that I was doing. I went to my room. I look, I actually look at the clock and it was 10 a.m. I lay down in bed. But let me clarify that I'm not a person that I do not like naps. Because then I wake up grumpy and I, I hate naps. So that's something that I usually don't do. So I laid in bed and as soon as I laid in bed and I closed my eyes, I saw a hand approaching me like this, just like this. Again, perception, a perceptive hand. And through that perceptive mind of mine, I went ahead and approached that hand. Immediately, I went into what I would call the, the realm of souls. And in the realm of souls, I could see all the souls that have moved from the earth plane to this realm. 
where they were still connected to the physical world. And I understood that that world was the one where the dead surrounds and the mediums can communicate with them because they're very, very close to them. But I was like in an imaginary bubble. I was able to see but not interact. Once I understood where I was, and when I say understood is that I believe that because there was a communication or a contact between that entity and myself, once that entity realized that I understood, it took me to the next realm. And when I say to the next realm, the way I could identify it is as if I were in just air and suddenly move into a realm where the air is denser or lighter or whatever. I mean, you can, I can feel the difference between realm, one realm and the other. There was like a separation uh, to make it even more dramatic. Like if I was on air and suddenly I go into water, something like that. Again, perception. And that's when I found myself in the, what, in the realm of knowledge, what people call the Akashic Records, the library, the book of records, whatever. And I felt like I was in a bubble looking at all those uh, geometrical figures, I could say. And I understood that, that this figure, for instance, had some knowledge, but you cannot access this unless you first grab this, because this one will take you to that one. And I could see all the knowledge around me, and I understood how it worked. It had no emotions, no feeling, just knowledge. And once I understood that, it took me to the next realm. You know that people say that there are five rounds, a hundred rounds, 20 rounds, blah, 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 blah. That's not so because, for example, here in, in the physical world on Earth, there, there are so many rounds. You have the one that is at a high level, highly uh, awakened, and then you have the much denser realm where a lot of evil is happening in this very Earth. So how can you identify how many realms there are everywhere if on earth there are so many levels. So I make that point because some listener might say, well, there are not three realms. There are how many realms? I mean, each realm have hundreds, if not thousands, or maybe millions of realms within those realms. So I'm doing the macro, not the micro. So after I understood the Akashic Records, let's say, I was taken to another realm. And that other realm, it was full of sparks of life. They were sparks all over. Maybe those are the sparks that my son saw when, when he went into a trance. I don't know. But that's the way I perceived it. And as those and as I perceived those sparks of life, I understood that that was life in its purest form. Not having yet reached the knowledge and wisdom, the apple, and not even having reached the, the soul realm, the densified spirit, which is the soul, neither have manifested in the physical realm. When I was at that point, I didn't know what was the next realm, but it was so very close because once I understood that, that entity that was with me took me to this humongous, I mean, it was extremely or limitless, light, brilliant light, but it didn't hurt. It was, it was, uh, it was 
a light that gave me the sensation that I belong here. This is part of me. And I felt so close and so much love being there that I could stay in eternity if needed. So close to it, but not merging. Was that light golden or white? I cannot tell. It could have been golden, but to me, it was more like white than golden. But to be honest with you, I cannot say. Golden as of yellow, no. But bright and white, yes. So as I was so close to it, I wanted to stay there forever. But I also knew that if that I didn't want to go any further because I would have to cease, cease to exist in order to become one with it. And by becoming one with it, I would be everything by being nothing. Because by being nothing, you're everything. And by being everything, for to be everything, you're nothing. Still, I didn't want to call it God. <laughs> but the moment I understood that, that entity that one next to me somehow made me look toward it. And as I looked toward that entity, that entity telepathically, I would say, wanted me to look back. At which I did. And when I looked back, I realized that I was so far away that I could not identify myself with it. That far I was. And I realized how far we still have yet to go to get to where I was. And all it, I needed was to merge with it, but I wasn't ready because I didn't want to leave my individuality. Remember that we talk about the individuality of God? I became the individuality. I didn't want to merge because I wasn't ready. See, and the moment I realized that, I remember looking at that entity, and we both acknowledge what I have learned. And once acknowledge, we both kind of say, okay. And instead of going realm after realm after realm, I went from here, boom. Open my eyes, and I wasn't even drowsy, sleep, or anything. I just opened my eyes like if I would have just laid in bed, closed my eyes, and opened my eyes. I look at the clock, only 10 minutes had gone by, but to me, it felt like an hour. And that's when I realized that all the transcripts that I have been writing about, understanding, they start making more sense because I went through the experience myself. My job as of now, as I understand it to be, is become the conduit for that information to come forward because the entity cannot communicate unless it's through somebody else. That somebody else happened to be me. Why did I was I chosen to do so? I don't know. You might be right. It could have been rebirth, or it could have been an accident. And uh, okay, now you have the knowledge. Now go back and teach. I don't know. All I can do is assume that this is my word. But if I go through my life experiences since my accident till today, everything fit perfectly. Everything. 
And the transcripts are a way to help humanity awaken from this dream that we have, believing that this is all that exists so we can get out of this treadmill to nowhere called Earth, called physical Earth plane, the wanting to keep reincarnating and not advancing any further and waiting for some something or someone to come from out there and say, no, this is a work that we have to do here ourselves because we got into this ourselves. That's why you see so much suffering. Do you think that God is going to bring suffering to us? And what would be the motive? I mean, that would be mind-blowing. I mean, how can a father let this happen to his child? Which, by the way, is another metaphor. A very, very smart metaphor to work with. Uh, but it was us all along who got separated. And many of us, your listeners, many of us are looking our way back home. And home is not a place to dwell, but a state of mind, a state of being. You said, er you said earlier that the physical world is an illusion. It is an illusion. And you just used the word a minute ago, a, a dream. When you were in the presence of that light, was that reality more real than here? It is as real as it can be. Let me put it this way. When I was in 1979 in the void, I remember being alive. I remember being myself. I remember everything. But when I came back, I remember when I was conscious and I remember when I was unconscious. Same thing in 2013. I remember as if I was there. In fact, when I say dreams and the physical world, the physical world is nothing but a dream. I don't know if you have gone this far, but for example, when you go in a dream mode, it is your soul experience, experiencing life while your body rests because your soul does not sleep. You keep experiencing life. And those experiences you're taking with you. How many times have you had a dream? And when you come, when you, when you wake up from that dream, you say, oh, I dream of this and that. And now you're careful doing things because that's affecting you. And that's part of your experience. And if you take your, your best dream, take, for example, your best dream, the, the dream that you love the most and you bring it to memory. I want you to remember that dream. Put it aside and take a life experience that was beautiful, that you cherished the most, and you go back and remember that. Put it aside. Bring both together, and you realize that they both come from the same place. That's it. That's why the physical world is only an illusion. Don't tell me that when you are dreaming, you're not running, you're not scared, you're, I mean, you're scared, you're running, uh, you say things, you remember things, you do things, and you're not saying, oh, I am dreaming, this is not real. No, it is real. It is very, very, very real. Yet it's a dream. Isn't this the same thing as this earth plane? The good, the bad, and the ugly that you have had and you're still here? Give it a lot of thought and you realize that the physical world is only an illusion. Earlier, you mentioned that these transcripts are on your website. Is that where people should go to read them or have you compiled them into a book as well? No, I haven't compiled them into a book. And this is the reason why. Those transcripts are recordings from those messages or those lectures, or those memory recalls, or those reminders that I received. It's comprised of different philosophies, theologies. Uh, I mean, uh, for example, just to give you an example, there is a lot of us above, so below. 
that come from hermetism. There's a lot of other philosophical things that come from philosophers from way beyond, but they uh, they do not identify themselves as such because this is a common knowledge. And uh, when I transcribing, it takes me a lot of time. Right now, I'm transcribing 2012, and I still have transcript for 2023. So imagine uh, how much information I have. What I do is that every week I transcribe one transcript. I was originally, most of them are originally in English. And uh, I asked myself, why, why am I doing this in English when my, my native tongue is in Spanish? Well, because I have to bring it to English and then do it in Spanish. If I start in Spanish, I will never make it to English because Spanish is my comfort zone. So actually that's another story because I was, I was working in Puerto Rico. I left everything. I sold everything. And I don't know why I did it, but I did it and I moved to Florida and uh, here I am. Uh, but literally I left everything behind to move here uh, to the state and start doing this in English. I do it in, in English. Now I'm doing them in Spanish. I'm transcribing them and I'm publishing them every Sunday morning. So if you go to my webpage, the transcript.org, there are uh, there are different tabs, home, about, and so forth. There, there's a tab that reads transcript. Next to it is a tutorial for you to 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 learn how to read the transcript. Get to the tutorial so you can have a better idea about the transcript. Go to the transcript and you can have, you can go to the table of contents right after you read the first page. Right there is the table of content and you can read any transcript that you want. Uh, I have oh, around 200 transcripts so far. And uh, every Sunday I, I publish the latest Sunday morning transcript. So if you subscribe, immediately you will receive the first transcript, which is that first transcription that I did verbatim. And when you read it, you realize that it answered all the questions many of us ask. But it was done in a very simplified manner because by that time, I wasn't unaware of this knowledge. So it had to be dumbed down to my level. And then every Sunday morning, you will receive one transcript, which is going to be the latest transcript for you to read it. You can send me an email. You can ask questions. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, I have done a lot of videos uh, explaining uh, the, the content of the transcript. Others are lectures that I have done in the past, messages that I have given. Uh, so it is all there for humanity to read because my job is to help us all awaken into the consciousness of oneness because we are one. It's like one of the transcripts said, we are one. And uh, truth is one, interpretations many. Because those many interpretations of that one truth has been given. But in this confused world, we have over 300 religions. And how many philosophies? So how can you extract that truth from all those many interpretations? Yet, truth is one. Because we're one, truth is one. And we are one infinite mind, endlessly expanding through the physical and spiritual realm, limitless. And limitless because of free will. Because we have free will, or limitless. Francisco, before we finish up, can you give us one last positive message? One last positive message. Okay. Let me resume the one aspect of the transcript that says, uh, life is one, experiences many. We are at the level where 
many of us say life is one we have to live this life go 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 live at your maximum that's so deceiving life is one experiences many means that we have been doing this for aeons that one life comprised of the many experiences that we have had through the year, through aeons, through lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, we need to wake up and realize who we are, where we came from. And many of us are looking our way back home, but do not know where to start. I can give you a head start through the transcript, away from theological ties to help you better understand. And once you understand, you're going to have a true north. You will know what to expect from yourself, what to expect from life. You will start stop blaming others for what happened to you. You start recognizing the karmic path, the law of cause and effect. Don't do harm to others because any harm that you do to others, you're doing it to yourself. And once we comprehend that, we're going to start becoming better human beings, one with another, as one. And as we start manifesting as one, we, stop, we will stop being separated by our self-nature. And as we become one, we actually can change this world. And it's not just to change this world, because this world is comprised of the good, the bad, and the ugly. But if we all unite and become better selves, in our next life, we can become better yet, and better yet, and better yet, until we learn to detach. And through detachment, we're all going to find our truth, who we truly are where we come from, then we can, we, we will be able to find our way back home. Francisco, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you for inviting me and I welcome every single one of your audience, including yourself, to reach out to the transcript, start reading the transcript and start learning higher truth. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.